Hi, I'm Melanie Ann Phillips, co-creator of the Dramatica Theory of Story. And in this episode of Beyond Dramatica, I'm returning, as promised, to the topic of fractal psychology. Now, in the last program, I described what fractal psychology was. It's the most crucial concept in the Dramatica Theory, without which the theory would not make sense. In fact, without this concept, the software based on the Dramatica Theory could not possibly work. It's essential. But what is it? It's the concept that psychology works in a fractal fashion. In other words, if you take two individuals and bring them together, and a number of other individuals, when you reach a critical mass, then that group self-organizes so that the entire group takes on the psychology of a single mind, replicating the exact same interests, issues, and drives that you have with each individual in the group. We all share a common operating system underneath our personal experience and cultural indoctrination, for example. And, as Buckminster Fuller said, the flow of energy through a system tends to organize that system. When you bring enough individuals together and reach that critical mass, then the group together will self-organize into the psychology of a single human mind. Well, that just carries it up one level. But even more than that, if you take a bunch of those minds, those pseudo-minds that are created, out of all these individuals, and you create another pseudo-mind, and another, and another, and reach a, cr a critical mass of pseudo-minds, then you end up creating an even larger mind, one magnitude up, which will have exactly the same kind of structure and dynamics you find down below in the smaller levels. In other words, it's almost like harmonics. You reach a certain harmonic point, and it vibrates the same way, has the same components, creates the same kind of standing waves, as it were. All right. The Dramatica chart in story structure, dating way back to 1994 when we had this one finally nailed, shows this as nested Russian dolls. You have basically four different levels. Each one starts made up of little individuals, which then group together to create one item above them, which is representative of a larger mind operating as the same as the dynamics and structure of these smaller individuals. And then these individuals up here, these new larger families, come together also to form a group of four, or a quad, which moves up to the top to become an even larger family. And then those come together to form an even larger family, and those come together, these things here, to form four different towers. And ultimately, you reach a four by four grid, essentially. You have four items laterally that are then carried down four levels in divisions into four, and you end up what we call the size of mind constant. Now what that means is this represents all of the considerations a human mind can make and still hold at the same time within itself the highest level, largest considerations, and all the detailed subdivisions that go down to the smallest, tiny details to be able to see the tiny ones and at the same time, at the very same moment, not putting it on memory and coming back and looking at it um, uh, while you're considering only it and then going deeper and considering that and getting focused and losing yourself in it, to be able to hold all this information from the largest points to the smallest, this is as big as the mind can handle and it's true for everybody. Why is it true for everybody? Because we live in a four-dimensional world. We have mass, energy, space, time. Our brains are made of mass and energy, space, time. And later on, in another program, we'll talk about how the actual physiology of the brain, the neurology and the biochemistry, ranging all the way from the, the boutons on the neurons and uh, the axons and the action potential, just banding about some words so you know there's some fun stuff coming up. Um, in talking about all of these neurotransmitters, how that works, those dynamics mirror the physiology of the brain in a dynamic sense. And this is a crucial concept, that dynamics can be transportable from one area to another area that is not at all physically related. It's almost like a synchronicity of dynamics, as it were. If something changes in one, it would have to change in the others. So when we say that there's a physiology in the brain and biochemistry, the neurology, that causes it to operate in certain dynamic patterns, that's why the psychology operates in those patterns, and that is why we then tend to project those patterns into everything we do automatically, whether or not it's just organizing the groups we're in, or even looking for understanding the patterns of, say, subnuclear physics, 
we're going to look at, at quantum theory, we're going to look at astrophysics and project these same patterns that are the ones we create in our minds because of our existence in four dimensions onto whatever we look at. In other words, when you look at something as deeply as you can, you go down to the nth degree and find it as detailed and into it as far as you can look, you'll eventually see yourself staring back. You will see a mirror because our own operating system of our own minds eventually is all we can see and we lose all of the content when we try to go into a level of detail that deep. Eventually there's nothing left but ourselves. All right. Now that sounds like a bunch of hokum. I wouldn't buy it. Let's talk a little more about the structure and I'll show you why it's not hokum. We built the structure the same way Crick and Watson built the structure of DNA. They knew certain things about DNA. At the time they thought it might be a crystalline form because uh, one of their associates had taken x-ray photographs of DNA molecule and it does have crystalline form. And they were thinking, okay, so perhaps it's a crystal, a uh, crystal molecule of some sort, but they didn't know exactly what shape it was. Well, they got these industrial strength tinker toys and they decided they would start building models. And if they came across a model that was accurate with all that they did know and also elegant in terms of its shape, strangely enough, they would then know that they probably had the structure of DNA. So they started experimenting with a single helix uh, spiral, and they experimented with other combinations of these uh, bases that they have, uh, the four bases in DNA. And believe me, the fact that there are four bases in DNA, that there are four bases in Dramatica slash, <coughs> slash mental relativity, which is the name we've given to the science of the psychology, and four dimensions in the universe is not accidental. It's not just coincidental. But there are four bases in DNA, and they found that it wasn't a single helix. They could put together a double helix, and in so doing, it actually was an elegant-looking model, and it did everything that they saw that it, it should do with their observation, and later on it was able to predict things that had not yet been observed. Okay, so similarly with Dramatica, we built this model. We did not build it based purely on observation. We had some observation, and we started putting it together first as this flat chart, and we didn't even have this. We didn't even have the nested families. We just had a list, like a periodic table of story elements, and they were in, for example, um, families like noble gases and rare earths, different kinds of psychology of characters. And then we found that they were actually nested, that certain terms weren't equal in size or weight in the mind, in thought or in feeling, to what was going on in the smaller dimensions. And because they were larger, they became the names of the groups, and then became the names of the groups of groups, and ultimately became the whole level uh, chart you see there. Later on, we found this representation was much more clear a way to see it. But this is actually a map of a quad helix. Like DNA, which has a double helix, we're looking at a double helix externally in terms of how the mind organizes data. And when we look inside, we see another double helix. The top of this chart, these two items are external, universe and physics. The bottom of the chart here, these two items, mind and psychology, those are internal. So these two form a quad helix, uh, a double helix up so uh, the top. This forms a double helix here, but they're not two independent double helices. They're actually a quad helix that works together and wraps around itself in four dimensions the same way that a double helix wraps around itself intertwined um, in terms of DNA. And at the base of each one is this quad. Everything is based on quads. So what is this quad that we see here? What is this? this quad. It's actually not just a placeholder. The framework of the quad itself, the position in those areas, the relationship among the items in it, that's actually an iterative equation. Iterative equation is what creates the nonlinear equations, what creates a Mandelbrot set or a Julian set. You've seen them. We're not saying this creates exactly a Mandelbrot or a Julian set, but it does create um, a fractal psychology by having this framework that actually represents an equation. So imagine now the equations within equations. They're all identical, but because they're iterative, they affect each other. Now, if they did it all at once, it would merely be a spatial model. One thing would change, and instantly all the others would come together like wheels within wheels, like a, a difference engine, as it were. But it happens also sequentially. Here's why. We've said in an earlier episode that you have every item in a quad has a number value, one, two, three, four, and that would be the order in which things would be explored. They also can be seen spatially as a little circuit with potential and resistance and current and power, okay, or outcome. 
I'll also put an O there for outcome. And those are the spatial way of looking at it. But the way this model winds up like a Rubik's Cube is that first we see what the problem or difficulty is, the grain of sand that creates a pearl, as it were, in the objective realm, in the external realm, in the realm of the real world, not the mind. We see what that is, and we wind things up to show what kind of potentials are at work. And then once this model has been wound up once, what it does is it winds up by doing something called flipping and rotating. Flipping and rotating. In a flip, you're going to exchange this with this position. So P would move down here, potential and resistance would move up there. And that's before you put your 1, 2, 3 on. That's just looking at it in PRCP. So they change positions, or these change positions. Current and power change positions. Also, it can rotate 90 degrees to the right or 90 degrees to the left. And when it does, that changes the relationship within the overall matrix of the variables in the iterative equations. I know I'm getting very deep here, but you asked for it. Okay. When that happens, and we've wound it up once, dealing with the double helix effect of, say, the external world based on the single grain of sand that is out of place in that world that causes everything to be out of kilter, then we apply to the mixed up set. Now remember, all the P's, R's, C's, and P's are mixed up in places they wouldn't be if they were properly balanced in a neutral or at rest uh, set. Okay. Then we add the 1, 2, 3, 4, and then we mix things up again with the internal grain of sand. Whatever is the internal grain that causes the problem to mix up and see how things jumble up then. So then, not only do you have PRCP out of order, but you also have 1, 2, 3, 4 out of order. In effect, what you have is the 1 and the 2 and the 3 and the 4 are no longer associated with the PRCP the way they would in a mind at rest, in a mind that had no difficulties. And the grain of sand that's in the external universe that we talk about, the external wind-up as we call it, that grain of sand is just the external view of the same grain of sand that you see from the inside. There are two different perspectives, our inner perspective and our outer. When we see a problem, we don't really have a problem in the universe. We might think we do, but that comes later. We look at something and say, we don't like the way that is. Well, is the problem that it's not the way we want it, or is the problem that we don't want it the way it is? In fact, the problem is that we want it one way and it is another way. It's the inequity or the unbalance or the differential between our inner calm and our outer calm. And this is caused by delay factors that later on we'll get into called phasing and gating. I'll give you a little hint. Phasing and gating. You ever look at a clock that has a second hand that goes and it bounces back a little bit each time. I remember, especially when I was a kid growing up in school, they didn't have a clock that would just go and sit there. Every time it ticked, it would go bounce, bounce, bounce. And I'm using myself in class by looking at that and blinking my eyes so that although the, the hand was going forward constantly down, I would only see it when it was bouncing back. And because I would only see it with a quick blink while it was bouncing back each time, Although I could perceive that it was moving forward, it always felt like it was going backwards, because that's the only movement that I saw was the bounce back. It was a very interesting experience. And in so doing, it later became part of the theory understanding, as we tried to say, what have we got here with this model, is that phasing and gating is what creates the interference pattern between our inner world and our outer world. It's what makes things not line up, because they don't happen simultaneously. There's a delay factor, like an inductor, for example, or a capacitor. And this delay factor is what causes things to not exactly uh, sync up, and it creates then interference patterns between our view of our outside world and our view of ourselves, leading us to have issues. And when we look at the central issue, using this model at the very bottom, that winds it up level by level, inside and outside. We see it from two sides, and that is what then creates our quad helix form. Now, the last thing I want to say about this is, this is as far as I can go in 15 minutes. We have to come back for part three, and we're going to talk about exactly how this thing winds up, and how we read it, and why it creates spirals as we move through it, and how those spirals of the quad helix ultimately work with the iterative equations here, and what those equations are. If this is just a framework, 
What are those equations? If these are just processes of the mind seen as objects, like an object-oriented uh, programming, what exactly are these processes, and how have they been objectified so that we can work with them as building blocks? Well, that's it for YouTube's Limit of 15 Minutes. Got to go for now. Look forward to seeing you again in the next episode of Beyond Dramatica. We'll answer a lot of those questions as well.